In 2006 in South Africa, um, there was a group called Heartlines that produced a number of films which they put on national TV. And these films were about values that they claimed that all South Africans share, no matter what their faith or what their background. But they wanted the churches of South Africa to watch these films, have their members watch them and use them as points of discussion. And why would they do that if these are values that all South Africans share? Why did they focus on Christians? Because they claimed that the majority of South Africans claimed to be Christian. And so they wanted churches to watch these values-based films to, to promote values and ethics. One of the values was forgiveness. And what I find interesting is that biblically, our concept of forgiveness is not the same concept of forgiveness in other religions or from a humanist perspective. That you cannot pay off sin by your own doing. That God has to step in and make a way. And when we get forgiven by God, it is not simply because God is a forgiving God or a merciful God, but that God has to put right what is wrong in order to bring about that forgiveness. And as we receive that forgiveness from God, we are then able to forgive. Why? Because Jesus paid it. And this value is not shared with other religions because biblical Christianity teaches that you cannot pay for your own sin. You would go to a lost eternity by paying for your own sin. Therefore, you stand condemned. And only by what God does can you be acquitted and forgiven. God doesn't forgive just because he forgives. God must deal with sin in order to forgive. And heartlines did not communicate this truth. And so what we see is at the heart of our faith is the cross of Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. And without this, there can be no salvation. When God sent his son, he sent him because there was no other way. And so today we're going to look at the necessity of the cross, that the cross was necessary. God didn't just send his son to go on a cross in order to show us that he loved us. What kind of sickness is that, that someone would take their kid and have their kid killed to prove that they love you. That's, that, if that's all it is, that's not love. No, God sent his son so that we could be saved. And because there is no other way. It's only by faith in what Jesus has done through the new birth experience that we can ever go to heaven. If there was another way whether now or in the millennium in the future or in eternity, that anyone could be saved except by faith in Jesus Christ, what he did, his finished work. If there was another way, then God sent his son in vain. He didn't have to send his son. The fact is, he did have to send his son. There is no other way of salvation. Those who were before the cross looked forward by faith seeing partly the truth, but trusting in that which was revealed to them. And we who are at the cross, whether now and the millennium to come, look back to the cross. And the reality of the born again experience has been made a reality because of the cross. So therefore, there is only one way of salvation, whether now or in the millennium. There is only the, because of the cross of Jesus Christ that anyone will go to the New Jerusalem to live with the Lord forever. It is necessary. And then we have the sufficiency of the cross, that God accomplished everything that needed to be done in order to secure our salvation. That there's nothing that can be added to the cross of Jesus Christ. And lastly, we have the power of the cross, that through the cross we're not just accepted and forgiven, but on the cross the power of sin and death was broken. And in Jesus conquered death in his resurrection. And therefore, we can walk in unison of life because of what was accomplished on the cross. But first, let's look at the necessity of the cross. The peop many people in this world ask the question, how can a good God send people to hell? 
And it's unfortunate that this question is posed in this way, for there's no, con there's no understanding of the concept of goodness in that question. Because if there was, that question would not be asked. A good God has to send people to hell. Because goodness, God's goodness means he has to hate anything to do with sin. That anything that's evil cannot go unpunished. Because a good judge will never acquit the wicked. When someone's killed somebody in cold blood, a good judge will not let that person go free. And so a good God sends people to hell. But maybe the, the, the better question to ask would be, how can a loving God send people to hell? And some people do ask that question. But the reality is that God is not simply kind and loving and merciful, but God is holy. There was a man called Jonathan Edwards. He was a, a preacher who preached the message upon which at one particular occasion, the people that heard were weeping over their sin and begging God for mercy. Why? Because he spoke of sinners in the hands of an angry God, that God hates sin, that God cannot agree with sin and he can't wink his eyes to sin. He's not like a corrupt police officer that says, put 200 rand on the floor and I'll see nothing. No, when God sees sin, he can only look at it in anger and wrath. Otherwise, he is not holy. A holy, good God cannot wink at sin and cannot be indifferent. He has to hate sin. Why? Because he loves that which is righteous. And so this creates a problem for we as sinners. What does it say in 1 John 1 verse 5? God is light and in him there is no darkness. There is no darkness. His light exposes everything. He sees everything. He knows everything. He sees the secrets of our hearts. And so we have a problem here. We cannot live with God in our sinful state. We cannot abide with him. God will not tolerate us to live with him in his place. He has to be separate from us. And so it says in Ezekiel, if we turn to his, uh, sorry, Exodus chapter 33, we have a situation where Moses, one of the most godly people of the Old Testament, stands before God and he's crying out and, God, and he's praying, God, show me your glory. He wants God's presence to be with his people in order that they can be successful in going to the promised land. And he wants God to do more than just deliver Israel. He wants Israel to see God. He wants God to reveal himself and he asks in verse 19 or verse 18 he says I pray you show me your glory and when Moses in Exodus 33 verse 18 says show me your glory what he's saying is God I want to see you as you are what is your essence what is your nature your character and God says in verse 19 I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. God defines his glory as his goodness. That the goodness of God is that which, which makes God holy and other to us. That he's in a league all by himself. And he says this, I'll make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord, his goodness and his name. And his name speaks of his character. In the West, we don't get names. Names tend to be labels for many people. Not for all, but for many people, names are labels to distinguish this person from this person. And we pick names because they sound nice. But biblically, names express something about the character of the person or the events around that person's birth. I don't think it's any coincidence that there were many ladies named Mary or Miriam in the time of Jesus' birth because Miriam's to do with bitterness and life was bitter under the Romans. At another time, there were women or at least one woman who was called Miriam at a time of oppression who was born during the time of Israel's slavery in Egypt. Life is bitter, Miriam. But you have other people 
the Lord himself, his name Yehoshua, Yeshua. Yeshua short for Yehoshua, meaning Jehovah is salvation. Why? Because he will save his people from his sins. His name expresses his essence, his character, his nature, and his work. And so his glory is his goodness, is his name. And it says, and I will be gracious on whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I show compassion. But verse 20 says, but God said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. And this is the truth. And this is the reality that God is so pure that as in our sinful form cannot stand before him. For if we did, we would die. Even the angels, if you turn to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 2, around the throne of God, you have seraphim. Seraphim are angels, and the word seraphim comes from the word saraf, which is to burn. And so these, maybe these are fiery angels around the throne of God, having six wings. And it says, with two, they covered their face. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. Even these holy angels who are so close to the glory and the presence of God, who are perfect in all their creation, in which there is no turning, there is no error, there is no malice, there's no wickedness with them. And yet even they cover their faces before an awesome and mighty God. God is holy. And the problem that we have in, in, in our human condition is we have yet to receive a revelation of the glory of God. Those of us who are saved and born again, we have seen. We have seen, our eyes have been opened, and we realized the reality of who God is. And we saw ourselves in the light of that. Without that reality, without that um, revelation, I'll always think I'm not too bad because I'm not like the other person. Oh, because I'm not like that. I didn't do this. Yes, I've got bad things, but I, I, you can't say it's bad like this. No, when we look at ourselves in the, from the perspective of the glory, the majesty, the power, the, the, the goodness, the purity of God. He is like that light, that, that bright blue light that you, when you stand in front of it with a white shirt that is clean. But there's an old stain. The stain shows up and it accentuates that stain. And then we are embarrassed for we know that all the eyes are looking at us with the stain that's so clear that we want to hide away. God is light and he shows up everything. And we need, if we have un unsaved loved ones, we need to pray that God opens their eyes to see something of his goodness and his holiness. That the starting point that we need to have in our evangelism is not that God loves you. But the starting point in our evangelism has to be the character of Almighty God. The, the fact of his existence and what he is like. And his law expresses his nature. That he says you shall not commit murder. Why? Because God honors life and life is precious to God and I am my brother's keeper. And even before that it says you shall have no other God before me that you shall not use the name of the Lord your God in vain. And so we have a problem. We cannot see God and live. We are separate from God. And so God in his holiness cannot fellowship with people without doing something to remedy Allah's condition. Look at Exodus 19. God meets with Israel at Mount Sinai. And he's coming down not just in the form of his spirit, but he's coming down in his glory. And therefore, the people have to get ready. They have to be ready to meet with the holy God. And in verse 12, God says to Moses that he's going to be on the mountain, they're to wash their garments and they're to be ready and not go near a woman. And then it says, 
God's going to come down on the side of all the people. In verse 12, he says, you shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. And so the sacredness of God and the awesome holiness and the purity of God means that he cannot have people in their ordinary sinfulness commune with him. He allowed Moses to go up. There were 70 elders that went up some way up. Only Moses could break through to right to the top. And so we have this situation. God puts boundary stones around the mountain. And that's very much a picture of his law. You see, when God dwelt amongst the people in the tabernacle, he put a system of worship in place so that he could dwell amongst his people without consuming them. Look what it says here. We go to Exodus chapter 19 and verse 22. Well, we'll go from verse 21. Then the Lord God spoke to Moses, or the Lord spoke to Moses, go down, warn the people so that they do not break through, like they don't overthrow the boundary stones. Don't break through to the Lord to gaze. And many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them verse 24 the lord said to him go down and come up again you and aaron with you but do not let the priests and the people break through overthrow the boundary stones to come up to the lord or he will break forth upon them and that word break forth is the word parats which it, 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 the word parats is like a breach and so by them overthrowing the boundary that god has put to protect them they make a breach in which God breaks through and consumes them. And this is very much a picture of the law. When Uzzah was steadying the ark, when David was bringing it back to Jerusalem, and the ark was on the back of a, a cart, which is the way that the pagans sent the ark back to them, on a cart. But they ignored the law of God, which said that the priests had to carry it on their shoulders. And so by, by following the pagans under David's instruction, he was responsible and the cart was steadied. Uzzah put his hand to steady the ark. He thought he was doing a good thing, but he completely treated God as profane in doing so. Even though his intentions were good, his actions were evil. And God broke through on him. And the place was called Peretz Uzzah to this day, it says in the text. By breaching, breaking the law, God broke through, created a breach. And so this is the problem that we, they've got. God wants to dwell amongst his people, but his holiness would consume them if he didn't put in this boundary place. You see, there has to be a separation between God and sinners. Look at Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59 verse 2. God is speaking to Israel. And he says this. Isaiah 59 verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. How many of us have spoken to unbelievers to encourage them to pray. When they don't even recognize that their sins have made a separation between them and God. That the, the, the agnostic does see something true. They say, well, maybe God exists, but how can you know God? And how can you claim you've got the monopoly on God? And what they recognize is that there is this separation between us and God. Maybe he's out there somewhere, but we, we can't know him. It comes down to sin. That is why we don't know God as we should know God. That's why God has to break through and reveal himself to us because by ourselves we could not find him. 
Because our sins have made a separation between us and God. This is why the Amazulu and the Amakosa here in South Africa and the people from the other tribes, the, the Botswana and the Batsutu and the, um, the, the Shangan the, uh, uh, the, and the, the Venda and all these people. This is why they worship ancestors. This is why they do things and rituals for ancestors, because they know there's a creator God, but he's so far away and he's different to us. He's spirit and we are flesh. And so they say our dead are closer to us than God. And so they become a mediator. They recognize there's a separation between God and men. But they don't know why. It's the word of God that says why. It's not because um, man was confused by a chameleon who brought a message of life and came slowly and God sent a message of death through a lizard and the lizard was quick and told the people, God says you will die. And they believed the lizard. And when the chameleon came because he loitered on the way, he said, God said you shall die. And the people said, you're lying because God's already told us we shall die. And that's how death came in and the separation between us and God. No, it's not the chameleon's fault. It's our fault. It's our ancestors, Adam and Eve's fault. That's why there is this separation between us and God. And so they try to bridge the gap by their ancestors. And other people try to bridge the gap by their guru. And other people try to bridge the gap with their church and their good works and all these things. And God's word says this, that our righteous deeds are as a filthy garment before God. A filthy garment is a menstrual cloth. And the word of God says that our good deeds are like a filthy garment to God. It is noxious to him. And so it's like taking a plate of good food and slapping a whole load of manure on it and dishing it up to the Lord, to the King of Kings. Our good works are tainted by our evil. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. This is speaking about foolishness. It's foolishness. But it's a picture of sin. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 1. Dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. So you've got the perfume that's been made up. It's going to smell lovely. And a dead, dead flies, these small things, land in there, they die, and they putrefy the lot. That's what foolishness is like. So a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. So you can't say that, oh, it's just a little sin. The little sin putrefies the lot. That if you put our good deeds and our bad deeds into a scale, and if even if our bad deeds were just a little bit and our good deeds were a lot, the evil would outweigh the good. You see, because we're looking at this now from the perspective of God's perfect holiness, we never measure up. We never measure up. And so the Bible says that in Romans 3 verse 10, there is no one good, not even one. Romans 6 verse 23 says, all have sinned and are falling short of the glory of God. If we turn to... Romans 5, verses 6 to 7. Romans 5, verses 6 to 7. It says, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were helpless, so weak that we could not rescue ourselves. And so we are helpless, completely helpless before a holy God. Every religion is tainted. And all our good works will not do anything to offload the guilt that we have. Matthew 7 verse 21 says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of the Father will enter. And he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice 
lawlessness. That all the good things that they do for God do not count for anything. Romans 1 verse 18 says, The wrath of God has been revealed. The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold down, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That God is wrathful concerning our rebellion. God can feel nothing but anger towards our sin because he is good, because he is pure, because he loves that which is good. And this creates a problem. You see, when we look at sinners in the hands of an angry God, we have to realize that the anger of God is not actually primary here. It's really sinners in the hands of a holy God. And his holiness means that his wrath has to be expressed against sin. It's the holiness of God that makes it necessary that judgment is given. For if he does not judge sin, but blinks his eyes to it or winks at it, then he is no longer good. So what could, what could be done? The cross had to happen. That in the, even in the Old Testament, God had to make some way to deal with sin in order that the people could still commune around the tabernacle with his presence being there. And he did it through sacrifice. In Leviticus 17, verse 11, it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. That your life is forfeit before a holy God. That you've sinned. You've destroyed the life of God that was in you. You're separate from God. And your life is forfeit. But God made a way that another would die in the place of the people namely these animals, and their blood was given, their life blood, their life was spilled in order to make atonement, to cover the sin so that people could fellowship with God without sin being in the way. And there were animals slaughtered all the time, continually. Why? Because people sinned continually and those sacrifices were never enough to deal with sin. In fact, every festival had sacrifices. There were morning and evening sacrifices. And the Passover, they had to sacrifice a, a, a lamb, a baby, um, a lamb or a kid, a baby sheep or a baby goat. They had to sacrifice one for the Passover. They had to do sin offerings. They had to do burnt offerings. They had to do peace offerings. And then once a year, they had to have a special goat offering. Called a, they, they, they had two goats. One they put their hands on and they chased it away and it was the scapegoat. And the other goat was given for atonement. And they would take the blood and the high priest would take it to the mercy seat on top of the ark to make atonement for sins that the people were not even aware of. That even the sacrifices and all the sacrifices that were offered that year were still insufficient. There still had to be another one. And this was done year after year after year after year. How seriously God takes sin and how lightly men take sin. How seriously God takes sin so much so that he offers all these animals in continual offering in order to make it possible that he could be with people that naturally would repulse him. But his heart longs for communion with them. Why? Because of who God is. Because he desires people. And so the cross, the cross becomes necessary because it's through the cross that Jesus offers the ultimate sacrifice, the once for all sacrifice, that would make us acceptable to God. Let's move on to the finished work of the cross, the sufficiency of the cross, that the cross is sufficient. The animal sacrifices, as we said, were continually offered. And why? Because they could only cover sin, but they couldn't take it away. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. 
For the law, since it is only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to have been offered? Because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consci consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's impossible that they could take away sins. They covered sin, but they did not take it away. In verse 11, it says, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. That is why they had to be keep they had to keep being offered time after time because they never fully dealt with sin. There's always a remainder of sin left. And so what we see about Jesus sacrifice in Hebrews 9 verse 26. Hebrews 9 verse 26 it says this. Jesus is not as a high priest who you know, offers himself often. Otherwise, he would have needed to have suffered often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, one time, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus died once for all, and that sacrifice is no, never repeated again. It's never represented again. In the Catholic Mass, there's an idea that when the priest prays over the bread and the wine with intentionality, that very bread and that very wine turn into the actual body and the actual blood of Jesus. That when a person's eating the bread, they're not eating bread, they're eating Jesus' body and they worship what they think is Jesus in the bread and the wine. They see the bread and the wine as the host. And Jesus is there, really present, physically there. They worship Jesus, so they think. But because the bread and the wine don't actually turn into the body and blood of Jesus, they're not actually worshipping Jesus. They're worshipping a piece of bread and they're worshipping a chalice of wine. It has not changed. It represents Jesus' body and blood in symbolism. And by faith, when we come to God in faith, whether at salvation or every time we take communion, we commune with him, we partake in his sacrifice by faith, not through the bread and the wine being changed. It, it, these are symbols. These are symbols. And by offering that and representing the sacrifice, they go against the scripture. Jesus was given once for all. It is never repeated again. Is never represented. It is never repeated. It is once for all. It is finished. Sufficient. And it works atonement. Atonement. Let's turn to Romans 3. Romans 3 verses 25 to 26. Romans 3 verses 25 to 26. It says this. Let's go from verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, that's God's gift of righteousness to make us righteous. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction for all have sinned and falls, are falling short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Meaning... When I get saved, there's nothing I did to earn it. It is a free gift, freely given by God, because the payment has been made already for the gift. And it was made by Jesus on blood. And then it says, Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be the just 
just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So Jesus, in verse 25, has been displayed publicly as a propitiation. The Greek word behind here is hilasterion, hilasterion. And in some translations, they use this word propitiation. And the, prop the word propitiation means that God's anger has been appeased, that God's wrath has been satisfied. And so now he's no longer wrathful to us because Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself. This word is so important that 20 years ago, when I was looking for a Bible, just over 20 years ago, when I was looking for a Bible, if it didn't have the word propitiation in, I wouldn't be interested in it. Because for me, it was such a fundamental truth that it's the sacrifice of Jesus that pleased, that, that, that satisfied the wrath of God so that the wrath has been spent and we can go free. But some translations translate this word as expiation. And expiation means a removal of sin, a complete cleansing of sin. And which, which word... Is the right word and the answer is they are both right this word hilasterion speaks of atonement which both deals with the wrath of god and also deals with the sin itself unlike the animal sacrifices jesus sacrifice wipes away sin and therefore we can be accepted and seen as completely clean before god the word hilasterion is used in the Greek Old Testament for Leviticus 16 verse 2. And it speaks of that mercy seat, that place that the blood was put on in order that God could look upon that and say, it, I accept the sacrifice. I will not consume the people. They can fellowship near me without me consuming them. Pointing forward to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 5 and verses 6 to 8. See, this is the, 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 the truth here. That the cross fully deals with the problem that we have. That we can be accepted before God. That God can say, no matter what you've done, you can come to me. Because I have made provision for you. That I have fully satisfied my anger against your sin. And therefore, if you accept my son, and you accept what he has done, I accept you. You are clean. You're forgiven. Romans 5 teaches us this, verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. If you cannot see your sinfulness, and you think you're basically good. The cross makes no sense. Why? Because he didn't die for good people. He died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. If you've got someone who does everything right. And his life is in danger. You're not going to sacrifice your life for his. Why? Because we're by nature selfish. We won't do it just because the person's a good person. Like good is in righteous. Though perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. If someone puts their life in jeopardy and they've saved your son and their life is in danger, you, you might even sacrifice your life for them because you think they're worthy of it because of the good that they've done to you. But no one would die for a rapist. No one would die for a murderer. No one would sacrifice themselves and go to jail so that a criminal can go free. No one would do that. But verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. And there was no reason he should have done so. There's nothing in us that drove Jesus to the cross. There was no loveliness in us. There was no goodness in us. There was nothing of worth in us that drove Jesus to the cross. Our worth is not, well, is not derived from ourselves. It's not some quality in us. Our worth is derived from Jesus. He 
gives us worth because he died for us and therefore he makes us worthy. The act of sacrificing himself puts worth on us that we don't have naturally. Come to the cross of Jesus Christ. There is no other way that you can even be accepted before God. I remember I was on a plane in New Zealand. Um, I was visiting in 2017. And um, I was sat next to a Hindu guy. And we got talking. And I said, I don't believe that you can just do good and somehow your, your bad things are forgiven. The payment needs to be paid. And he said, no, no, you have to pay for your sins. You pay in the next life. And then I said, well, how can you get out of that cycle of karma where you sin and then in the next life you pay for that sin because something has to happen to you to make you suffer for what you did. And so the cycle will never end. I said, even if you are a yogi, a guru, and you live perfectly, but you have these bad thoughts, you're going to have to pay for that in the next life. How will we ever get out of that cycle? And he had no answer for that. But I had an answer. How we can be accepted and forgiven and cleansed because one pays the price for us perfectly. I spoke to a Hindu, a, a Buddhist person at a, a workplace in Palmerston North. I used to teach English at a college and he was a, a certain type of Buddhist. And he said, no, he didn't even believe about a way out of the endless cycle to get to Nirvana. The issue is not getting to Nirvana. It's being in the process. That's the main thing. There was no answer to get to you to Nirvana. He had none. The Bible has the answer how sinful people can be completely forgiven and be confident that there is a place for them in heaven. Why? Because one has paid the price completely on the cross. Jesus says, it is finished. Not only that, but Christ was triumphant on the cross. He was triumphant on the cross. Let's turn to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1 and verses 21 to 23 says this. He's speaking to Gentile believers and he says, Although you were formerly alienated from God and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before God holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed... You continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard. Our salvation is conditional upon continuing faith. That we are reconciled and God will present us before him, holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if we continue in faith, in the faith, firmly established. Christ made us acceptable to God. And then further on, if we t turn to chapter 2, and verses 13 to 15, it says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having cancelled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So what happened is we broke God's law, and God's law is a testimony against us and says, this person's done this and this and this and this, and Jesus comes to the judge, his father, and says, this has been done, this has been done, but it's paid in full, sorted, and the father accepts that. We forgive him. If you accept the, the, the salvation that's in Christ Jesus and you turn your life to him and you live for him and you turn away from this life, you start a new life with Jesus, you're completely forgiven of everything because of what the Lord has done. He has won the victory over the condemnation that was against us. But not only this, it says, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, 
He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. He beat Satan on the cross. He beat the principalities on the cross. And the work of the enemy was undone by the cross. It's like the flag had been planted in the enemy soil. And the flag says, I've won the victory you have lost. There's still the cleanup operation. There's still going in to possess, but the victory has been won. Christ made a show of all the principalities. When they thought he was at his weakest and they would cause him to sin and get himself off the cross, when they thought that he would mess up at his weakest, at his weakest, he won the victory. His weakness was stronger than their strength and all the power of the enemy that they threw at him with all the temptation and all the darkness that he experienced at that hour, he proved triumphant over the enemy. He won. Let's turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 Look at this. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord so that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. That through the cross... Not just the enemy, but myself, my old nature, my natural person has been dealt with. And God has given me a new identity. That repentance primarily, as well as turning away from specific sins, fundamentally is to turn away from this life to start a new life with Jesus. That is the primary repentance that every person has to undertake, that I turn from this life and I become a new person in Christ, that Christ has dealt with sin. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Not just dealt with the enemy, he's dealt with my sin nature. He's dealt with the principle of sin and death that rules me, that I no longer belong to that society. I no longer belong to Adam's community, but I've been transferred to a new community. And so it says in Romans 8 verse 1, Therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. I can die full knowing that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. Not hoping for the best. Not thinking maybe I'll get there. But I know that I am saved and I am accepted. And that there is a place at God's table for me because of what Christ has done. There's no condemnation. Whatever consequences I still live with from the sins of the past do not indicate anything concerning my eternal destiny. But rather, because of Christ, I am assured of my salvation. Why is there no condemnation? Because for those who are in Christ Jesus... For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. In other words, you used to belong to that. That was your master. But Christ dealt with sin on the cross and he broke the power of it. And therefore, look what it says. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. 
sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Meaning, if I walk in the spirit, I am able to follow the Lord. Why? Because the power of sin and its mastery over me was broken at the cross. And this, so the cross is not just the means of our acceptability to God. It's not just the means by which God forgives us. It's the means of our victory that we can walk in a victorious life, not meaning without sickness and pain and suffering, but meaning in a way that honors and glorifies God, even though I might not do it perfectly. Christ has dealt with the punishment. Therefore, when I serve God, I'm not serving him so that I don't get punished. Christ has dealt with that. I serve him to please him. And I can please him. Why? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith pleases God. And faith is placed in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, which deals with the wrath of God so that now... There's no wrath against my sin. There's only joy at my salvation, but I must walk in it. God's, the, the, the God's work through Christ on the cross took the key and unlocked the door of my cell. And there I was in my cell and the door was open and God says, the door is open. You are free. I paid the price. You're free. But there's no point in the door of the cell being unlocked, if I'm going to stay in the cell. My experience of life will not change as long as I stay in the cell. No, I must exit the cell. I must walk in the freedom that God has already purchased for me. And that process is called sanctification, where I walk with Jesus. But the cross made me free. I can walk in victory because Christ has won the victory on the cross. There's no condemnation. I have a new start, not just a new start. I have something more than that. There was um, a, a, a former pastor of mine was a guy called David Hamilton. He used to be UVF terrorist. And he wrote his testimony, a book called um, A Cause Worth Living For. And he, in this, there's, a very, there's this quote that I will always remember. And he says, Christ does not give us a new start in life, but he gives us a new life to start. That it's not simply a New Year's resolution. It's a brand new existence. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If anyone be in Christ, they are a new creature. The old has come. Before, behold, all things are new. I am a new creature. I have a new identity. Christ is my identity. And the whole role of sanctification and walking with Jesus is to learn to think, walk and live like that new person. But I am a new creature in Christ. He did that and I receive it at salvation. How do I receive this gift? This free gift that God has given that I can do nothing to earn. How do I receive it? In Romans 10, Verses 9 and 10, it says the following. This is the word of faith that we're preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, I must confess his lordship. What does his lordship mean? It means now he has bought me. When I come to Jesus, it's not simply so I don't go to hell. When I come to Jesus, there's a transfer I'm no longer owned by Satan. I'm owned by him. He has first place in my life. He has the sovereignty. He's the one that sets the limits, the boundaries, the parameters. And I've committed my life to him. It's not possible to accept Jesus as savior and not Lord. Because we confess him as Lord. We confess Jesus as Lord. We make that profession. We know he is the one who rules the universe. We're not making him Lord, we're acknowledging him as Lord. 
and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that implies that you understand that the sacrifice that Jesus made when he was on the cross was fully accepted by the Father. And he proved it. Why? By raising him from the dead. That there is a resurrection, that death is not the end, that he's won the victory over sin and death. And therefore, I have a hope that in my resurrection in the future, that I'm going to get a new body just as Jesus gained his new body. And the disciples that saw him went to their deaths, all um, nine, ten of the eleven of those who were faithful to the Lord. Judas accepted from that. And Matthias and many others went to their deaths testifying that they saw Jesus raised from the dead. Not as a phantom, but one that they could actually put their finger in the holes in his hands. The one that they saw eating fish in front of them. The one that they saw was not just a spirit, but had a brand new body. This is the Christ that we believe in, we trust, we, we trust in him. Belief is trust and it's persuasion, it's conviction. You know that he is who he said he was. And then it says this, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, it says you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. For the scripture says whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. And verse 13 says, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't have to pray a particular prayer. You have to confess the Lord and believe him. You turn from this life to the next life and you are saved. And from that, we start walking with Jesus as new creatures in Christ. Mm -hmm.